entering the room. We'll, we'll just give everybody a few minutes to get sorted out. Um, there'll be people sort of joining. We'll, we'll give ourselves maybe um, five minutes or so, uh, and then we'll start the welcome and introductions. I see some familiar names, so welcome. <laughs> Tasha, just checking in quickly with you. Um, are you monitoring the waiting room? So you'll just let people in? Yes. Okay, thanks. There's the classroom. <laughs> Two shots of the classroom. Oh, that's good. Mm. Yeah, I was saying um, before it was it's so nice to see human beings in a in a shared space. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> I have a I have a son who is very um, who's a big hockey fan. So we watched a big hockey game last night, and uh, so Montreal and Toronto, and of course Montreal won. So the biggest, most exciting piece of that news was not necessarily who won or lost, but that the game six is going to have people in person wow. at the game. <laughs> I bet the tickets are sold out. I heard on the radio this morning that a ticket in the nosebleed section was selling for at least $1,300. So you have to really, really love hockey or those teams, or you're just so excited to see humans in a space again that they're going to be spending <laughs> a lot of money for one hockey ticket. Yeah. So, Mark? Yeah, we'll give them a, a bit of time to get sorted out. I'll wait for a cue from them. And um, and I see Arlen. Hello, Arlen. Do you have others with you there? Hi, Katrina. Yes, we have our team here. Um, Maya and Luke are both flex uh, medical students um, with us. And Elise is our workline student. And Irvi, our research assistant, is also joining us today. Excellent. Wonderful. Great to have all of you joining. That's wonderful. Yeah, nice to see you all. <laughs> you too. Is Stefan going to join us? I believe so. I think he might just be logging in. Excellent. I talk to Reed in 15 minutes, I heard. No, we're talking to him at 12.15. Oh, 12.15. Yeah. Also, I'll just hang on and wait for a cue from Mark and Joanna that things are, are set up there. And um, maybe I'm going to just send a quick note. Tasha, have you heard from Lee this morning? I haven't, actually. Right, I'm just going to send a quick note to her as well. Not yet. Uh, right. Over here. Okay. Nice yeah. 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 That's better. Hello. Hi. Welcome. Are you all set? I think we're all set. Yeah. We put somebody in charge of sharing the screen that actually knows what they're doing. <laughs> this Not is nice. the last. <laughs> Welcome everybody to our IGS classroom. And yes, school is in session. <laughs> this is good. Much to the envy of uh, most of Ontario, I think. Probably, yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, welcome. Um, 
I think we it's five past 10, so we'll get started. There may be a few more people joining us yet. Um, I'm really happy to see your classroom. I'm happy to offer some welcome and uh, be a bit of a host for today. My name is Katrina Plamondon. I'm the co-chair of the um, Canadian Coalition for Global Health Research's University Advisory Council, which is a mouthful, but really what it is is a, a role supporting um, good dialogue across uh, universities um, that have some role and interest in global health across the country. I also sit as a, a professor in the School of Nursing at University of British Columbia, and I'm joining you this morning um, right close to Okanagan Lake, which is a beautiful, um, massive lake that I was born right beside and have spent most of my life um, uh, living close to uh, on the beautiful and unceded territory of the Silk people. Um, and many of us are joining from different parts of British Columbia and uh, all on um, traditional and for in, in British Columbia, mostly unceded territories of, of many um, First Peoples of this land. So I'll invite all of you as you're introducing yourselves uh, to offer acknowledgements of land and where you're coming from and joining us from if you wish. Um, we are so happy to offer this webinar and hear from leadership from young people in this province on issues of, that really are all of our issues um, around the future of our planet and the future of humanity on it. And I'm so happy um, to, to be sharing and learning from the Institute for Global Solutions. So um, we have several people joining us. Uh, I'll just give a very brief introduction to names and then I'll invite each of you to say a little bit more about who you are and where you're joining us from um, as each of you speak. So Mark uh, Neufeld, who I've had the pleasure of knowing for several years now through my connection with Vic uh, and the CCGHR um, and uh, Mark in his leadership role and uh, with um, Claremont Secondary and with the, the found, as a founder of the Institute for Global Solutions is joining us with Joanna and Joanna, I forgot, I'm sorry if I say your name incorrectly, please correct me. Is it Linger? Linger, yeah. Linger? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Graham Mitchell, um, also with the program for IGS. And then we have youth leaders joining us, Livia Ashbourne, Troy Patterson, Jamie Helmke, Ellington Peacock, and Caitlin Fredette. Uh, if you want to give a wave, I think you're at the other end of the classroom right now, standing up with there. Wonderful, lovely to have you. And then Maya Gislason and Musa Megasa will be offering some commentary at the end, uh, and we'll have some time for good discussion at the end of the presentation. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark and team uh, at Claremont Secondary and um, look forward to hearing from you. Hi, we are on the uh, southern end of Wuxanic territory, which is a pretty magical place to get to learn. We're actually sandwiched between a couple of lakes and uh, the ocean. And so we have had this program now for 10 years. We are the Institute for Global Solutions. Um, I had taught global studies for a while. And then along came this remarkable young man uh, who had written a sustainability 11 and 12 uh, course with the Ministry of Education. And we ended up in the same school. Um, and we floundered along for a number of years until Joanna Linger came and basically made everything work properly. We also have another teacher who's not here because he's actually teaching right now. He's teaching a uh, biology class. Chris Holman is his name. So switch it. <laughs> what is that? Oh, perfect. So we've been really lucky to blend essentially science and social studies. But to be honest, uh, we're not afraid of going outside of disciplines um, if that's what our kids need in order to enable them to be problem solvers. Exactly. The picture you see there is from, uh, Dad, you're not muted. <laughs> the picture you see there is actually from outside of Portland, Oregon, a place called Hood River, where we got a chance to go down and visit. Um, we have a number of big trips that we do. Hit it. As you can see, we have, we've over four different grades. Uh, it varies a little bit in the offerings, as you can see there, uh, but mostly science and social studies, um, which works really well. We're trying something new next year because of we're influenced by 
uh, Thomas Homer Dixon and his recent book called Commanding Hope. Uh, we're going to try to put environmental science and philosophy together, which is going to be thrilling, I think, for us. Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, the whole idea is we not only think about things, we think about things through our heart, but we also try to get out there in the real world and do things that uh, make a difference because it's one thing to learn about things that are hopeful uh, and we try to do that as much as possible, but unless you're doing something about it, unless you're actually doing something that makes you hopeful, we found it's not nearly as powerful and always through an interdisciplinary offering. Thank you, Caitlin. Do you want to jump in here for a while? Sure. Dr. Linger? <laughs> I'm not a doctor. <laughs> Hi. Uh, so these are just a few photos of some different uh, field studies we've been on. Uh, we really do try to combine as many different kind of aspects of learning as we can on these field studies. You can see students out on the water, um, learning in caves, uh, doing some watershed restoration. Uh, there's lots of you know, activities we can do right here from Claremont. Um, but also getting out into the community is a big part of the program. Uh, so this is a, a field study we did back in February. Uh, we connected with a local organization called Peninsula Streams, and we were able to actually do, um, you know, some citizen science down on the beach. We surveyed the sand, we looked for forage fish eggs, uh, and the data that was collected is actually being used by the DFO uh, to help protect our beaches and to look at, you know, food chain systems in our oceans and uh, maybe where some missing links are. So the kids actually got to really embark on some real science uh, and some science that's actually, you know, being used to, to make some new policy, which is pretty exciting. Uh, and another, you know, big kind of concept, I think, in our program is this idea of two-eyed seeing. We were able to connect with, we'll take this off for a second. Um, Albert Marshall, who is an elder in the Mi'kmaq Nation, and uh, he came up with this concept of two-eyed seeing, which is really just bringing Indigenous ways of knowing and Western science together and the power behind, you know, combining these kind of two ways of knowing uh, into really understanding our world and, and the systems and how they work and how we can protect them. I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Mitchell now. <laughs> is there a doctor in the house? Good morning. Uh, my name is Graham. Um, so part of our program, it, it started as a niche program with just 23 students taking part. It's now really grown. We have almost 200 learners now taking part from grade 9 to grade 12. And a huge emphasis uh, of our model is to look at the tools, the models, and the ideas that exist and look at ways of amplifying them um, and pushing them out into the world. So we don't shy away from the challenges, but we also spend a ton of time looking at solutions. So a big part of our mandate, especially for the senior levels, grade 11 and 12, is getting the kids out a ton. Although this year has been a bit more of a challenge, um, but we spend a lot of time out of the classroom, learning from uh, business members, activists, farmers, you name it, we try to put them in front of our kids. But a huge part of our, our model also at the senior level uh, revolves around traveling. So we do some fantastic trips that culminate. We have a cross country trip called Rails to Relevance where we put a bunch of teenagers on a train in Vancouver and travel across our country and, and culminate in, uh, in Ottawa with MPs and everyone along the way. And then in grade 12, this is our Rails to Relevance uh, classroom here with a bunch of students on a train, which is always an amazing adventure. And oftentimes we get our, our uh, MP, Elizabeth May and MLAs join us on the trip, which is just fantastic. And along the way, students are asked big questions. What does it mean to be a citizen of Canada? What is Canada's responsibility to the world? And so uh, as we embark on these adventures, they kind of try to frame these trips through that lens. Um, unfortunately, this last year, we didn't get to do Rails to Relevance, but we're excited because it looks like we have a go for the fall. So it's coming up in a few months. Um, I will pass it back over to, to Mark here, um, but a big part of what we are finding is that students seem to be voting with their feet. Um, whilst we combine science and socials, which are regular courses, we are finding that by having them together, by having a cohort, by having teachers who team teach, and they get to be with these learners year after year, 
we're finding that we are creating kind of an environment that is very conducive to kids feeling a part of something and adults feeling a part of something. So whilst we're only one school and one program, we feel like we're, we're starting to find a bit of a recipe for, for what works. And by giving students an opportunity to kind of look at solutions that exist and having them play a role, um, yeah, we, we hope to be able to share some of this with you today. I'm gonna to pass it back over to our principal for the day though, Mr. Mm -hmm. Newcomb. It's true, I don't always wear a jacket. <laughs> Um, this one is particularly powerful. So the grade 12s get to go to Haida Gwaii. Um, Gujao was able to meet us, uh, who's the gentleman that you see there. He was the leader of the Haida Nation when they decided they didn't want any more logging in the southern part of Haida Gwaii. And that place is now Guaihanas. And so one of the great blessings of this program has been how many speakers that we've been able to get. Um, right there is just really a smattering of the speakers that we've had either in the school or we had a chance to go and see in their home territories. Um, there's no, one of the greatest gifts I will say maybe personally is that we, I've spent a lot of time, this is gonna be the end of my 28th year of teaching. I still don't know everything as it turns out. So my father once taught, taught me that problem-based learning is great because uh, when you get everybody in the room, weighing in on a challenge, weighing in on a problem, it's always gonna be more helpful than just one person. And so we've been able to reach out these remarkable speakers anytime we're trying to solve problems we think is beyond the things that we can do. And so the final, the final year we do a capstone project. Um, so you can go to that now, Caitlin, thank you. Um, and I'm just gonna give you one example and you're about to hear from our students and hear some more examples. But what you see there are three young men in grade 12. Um, they have five solar panels that they did a bunch of research about. They're actually from Calgary. Um, the destination was Guada Guada, Uganda. So my family and I got to take those five solar panels the following Christmas and actually deliver them to Guada Guada. And currently they're powering a really small um, computer lab uh, in a sort of rural poor area um, outside of, right, right on the border of Kenya and Uganda. So the scope of these things, although they're local and much of the money was raised by a fundraising thing we call CC350, which was another capstone project. Um, the power that these go, kind of extends beyond their high school. So the young man in the middle of the three won an award at Queens University in his second year, or no, Western University in his second year for the project he did in his grade 12 year which is really neat. And we hear often from our students, they'll come back and they'll say, you know what, uh, you know, I was learning this stuff in grade 11 and 12 that I'm now just getting to in my second or third year of university. And we really are excited about some of the programs we're seeing and that we're getting to send our kids into. So um, that's enough from the adults, I think. We have some remarkable young people, you know, nearly 200 of them but we had the really difficult job of choosing a few just so you could have a taste of just how powerful um, and how ready young people are to start um, not only sharing their ideas, but leading. So I'm gonna introduce you to a young woman called Livia. Livia, are you out there? Hello and good morning, everyone. My name is Livia Ashburn and I will be giving you a brief presentation on the economics of climate change. Maybe if you wanna take your mask off, you can, so they can hear you better. But to properly understand the current status of our economy and our environment, we first must take a look back, all the way back to the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution changed so many aspects of our lives. I'm only here amongst my peers because I'm not out hunting, wondering where my next meal will come from. Automation, will lead to innovation. The more we can make more excess manpower, the more we can, time we can spend making new creations. This snowball effect seemingly affects everyone in a positive way, creating even more power, even more status, even more luxury. But it's addictive. No one wants to sleep on the cold right now. No one wants to go back to the cave age where we're struggling. I'm standing here in a heated building 
with lights, with a floor, with a family. And I don't want that to be taken away from me. People get scared when we hear that we need to change something that we've known for so long. But no one was ever debating that there were benefits to fossil fuels, there were benefits to coals. They have paved our roads into the future, but they can also become the earthquakes and tsunamis that can tear them right back down and keep heavily down the road. So what shifts are on the table? What are we wagering must change and why must it change? The economy and its people are two major reasons for hesitation regarding a shift. The demand for fossil fuels exploded in the 1950s, creating a massive demand where countries that could produce did so incredibly well. Think Saudi Arabia, America, even Canada. Still today, we base 3 to 8% of our overall GDP or gross domestic product in fossil fuels. This, over the next 10 years, will equate to roughly 250 billion. For context, this is roughly a tenth of our national debt. And in, in another factor, there's 500,000 jobs in the fossil fuel industry. As you can see on the screen, this is Suda Stadium. It houses 40,000 people. Shoulder to shoulder, row after row, it can be filled 12 times. Each person has a family and each person has people they need to produce for. So that's it though. We have 3 to 8% of our GDP and 500,000 people, and we can't just abandon them. This shift is recommending that we choose our climate over our people. That's a large misconception that everyone seems to have nowadays. We are not asking to get rid of the old and replace it with this new shiny thing. We're asking for a shift. Government intervention is needed. It is not going to be magical and it's not going to happen overnight, but it must happen. So what are the concerns? There's a lot of them. The biggest concern is the cost of a shift, the cost of a revolution. As you can see on screen to the left, in 2009, the cost of solar energy is the red line, and it's far higher than anything else in the market. For context, coal has stayed stagnant. Over the, over the years, you can see that it has not changed, and it hasn't for a long time. But solar energy has taken a dive. And this is because the economy of scale. Economy of scale dictates that the more you have and the more you want something, the less it'll cost, the more you use it. This is the basic principle that allows solar energy to be so prominent. We could see a day where your power bill that's now $500, $800 can be in the double digits. Because once the solar energy has been installed, it does not need anything other than cleaning or maybe a replacement. But once again, if it's so obvious, why haven't we changed? The big titans, we blame them for being selfish, for being greedy on money, but they have a duty to protect the investors and their interests. They maintain the status quo because that is what's asked of them by their investors. So we can't blame them for that. But we need to hold them accountable. They have been maintaining the status quo for many years and has done great things for this country, but we need to realize that a shift is possible. The second that that red solar line took a dive and crossed coal and oil, it became more eco-friendly, more money-friendly, and more beneficial for the economy. And let's have some misconceptions. There's a lot of them out there. The biggest one is that the Canadian economy cannot survive. It's very true. Three to 8% of our GDP is based in gas to oil. But rather than thinking, will it survive a shift, we need to start thinking, will it survive if we don't? It's very true that we have faced a lot. We have put too many eggs in one basket. But the problem is that we need to start moving those eggs. Because with the past simulation of the Keystone XL pipeline, we have seen a shift in the market. People no longer are demanding oil and coal in such grand numbers that they once were. People say it will destroy the balance of what we have, but the balance is already shifting. The market is disappearing, and what happens if it dis disappears tomorrow? Another factor is that rural communities, people say that rural communities are a supporter, that they require this energy to be consistent. But solar energy and wind energy and renewable is consistent. 
if anything, it'd be beneficial for rural communities and their sub economies because a lot of them based off tourist industry, whale watching, what happens when pollution takes over and you can't go on nature walks without there are gas masks? What happens when the trees all disappear because of logging? And on a darker note, that every little bit counts. We have been told that if you take shorter showers, if you just do your part, that you can make a difference. And it's true, we can make a difference. But take a shorter shower is not gonna change anything. It changes little to nothing because we cannot decide where our energy comes from because it's so heavily based in oil and coal and fossil fuels. We can try and be eco-friendly, but it will not stop the fact that the large producers create so much waste, it will overturn our decisions. A city could shut off its water for maybe a week, and it could be less impactful than per se the oil industry going on a Christmas break. And finally, that nothing is being done. This is the biggest lie of the planet. We are moving, we are shifting. The governments have noticed and the people have noticed. This is a problem and it is an issue. And we are tackling it as best we can. But we need more than a few voices that are screaming at the top of their lungs. We need a movement. And we have movements, but we need more people to get involved. And finally, I want to leave you with a quote. Not by an expert, not by someone who is an environmental specialist, but by a 14-year-old girl who has done her research and has worked. If other nations had directly participated in a fraction of the damages caused by climate change, we would be staring down the barrel of a full-scale world war. So why is it okay that because climate change does not have a face or a flag that we let it run rampant across our world, destroying my future and my children's? Tourism is just one of the industries that rely on climate. Shouldn't we protect them too? I thank you all for your time, and I hope that this inspires a conversation. All right. Uh, hello, my name is Troy Patterson. Uh, as you already know, I'm a grade 10 student here in Victoria. Uh, today, I'll be sharing with you my journey in efforts to stop BC's coastal gasoline pipeline. Um, first, a little bit about the coastal gasoline pipeline. Uh, the pipeline is supposed to start in Dawson Creek, a small town in northeastern BC. The pipeline will then travel 670 kilometers across the province until it reaches its end de destination of Kitimat on BC central coast, right in the middle of BC's massive Great Bear rainforest. The coastal gasoline will be transporting natural gas to a $10 billion manufacturing plant making it the most expensive project ever undergone on Canadian soil, uh, where the gas will be turned into liquid form, then shipped to markets uh, in Shanghai. Uh, okay, so let's talk about uh, my journey to stop this pipeline. It all started in early 2020, right before COVID-19 hit. I got a news alert on my phone and its caption read, people in Wet'suwet'en Nation are being arrested and that the coastal gas link will stop for nobody. Uh, at this point, I started to realize that this may be something worth looking into, so I did. And after I had done some research, I quickly came to understand that this pipeline was not a good idea for BC's future. For months after COVID-19 hit, uh, environmental issues such as the Coastal Gas Link uh, project uh, lost focus. It was at that moment that I knew that I needed to uh, fight for what I believed in and bring awareness to people that this was going on. Uh, so I worked on creating an online petition titled Save BC's World-Renowned Great Bear Rainforest from the Coastal Gas Link Pipeline. And then I posted it. The following afternoon, I shared my new petition with every contact in my phone uh, and asked them to share it with everybody that they knew. That night, I remember being so excited when my petition broke 100 signatures. If only I knew what was about to happen next. In the weeks to follow, my petition kept growing with signatures reaching into the thousands. People donated money to my petition, resulting in the website sharing it with more and more people. 
my petition quickly skyrocketed. Currently, after nearly four months, my petition to stop the coastal gas link pipeline sits at just under 24,000 signatures, with more people signing every day. Uh, this, inevitably, this inevitably resulted in the news getting involved. After a month, uh, about a month and a half ago, I was notified by a reporter named Jake Brown from Black Press News that he would be interested in doing a story on my success with the petition. Uh, I met with him and gave the story of how my petition came to be. The next week, my story was broadcasted in more than 35 different news outlets across British Columbia. Uh, this opened the doors to a whole lot of opportunities for me. Um, I started to email different ministers and MLAs, hoping to get a brief virtual meeting with them. Weeks went by and I heard nothing. Then finally, I got a meeting secured. It was for the following Wednesday uh, to meet with BC's Minister of Environment and Climate Change Strategy, George Heyman, and his lead LNG, uh, Marine Advisor Scott, for 30 minutes. Uh, during this meeting, we discussed multiple topics, including emissions, costs, wildlife management zones, and how tanker traffic will affect the abundant marine life. Uh, while both the minister and Scott gave good answers to some of my questions, uh, a lot of answers uh, were simply left out, I'm not sure what to tell you. Uh, and even when I did get an answer, there were multiple times uh, when they tried to give me an answer that simply was not true. For example, at one point, Marine Advisor Scott was trying to explain to, explain to me how the natural gas pipeline is much safer for the environment than an oil pipeline when it comes to leakage, considering the oil would go down into the ground and harm the earth, whereas the natural gas will just go up into the sky and disappear. Uh, so I decided to keep him on his toes uh, and replied, actually, Scott, while the oil is terrible for the environment by heavily affecting the ground, the natural gas is no better, if not worse. As the gas leak will go undete undetected to the average eye, all while releasing harmful methane gas, which is 20 times worse for, the, for our atmosphere than CO2. Therefore, in increasing our provincial emissions by an alarming rate. Scott then replied to this with one of the all too common answers. I don't know what to say. After seeing how the minister and his team failed to answer some of my key questions, it only made me more convinced that this project was not being assessed realistically, uh, with the government only focusing on the possible money from this project and not what is at stake. So I, de I decided to go to the news for a second time. Uh, after my second province-wide article was published, this time it being about my meeting with Minister Heyman, I started to email more politicians. And while Premier John Horgan informed me that he could not possibly meet with me at this time, I did manage to secure a virtual meeting in June with local MLA Murray Rankin, BC's Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Um, finally, my goal for this for the meeting with MLA Rankin is to inform uh, him in depth as to what is going on uh, with both the climate and First Nation issues that are abundant in this coastal gas and pipeline project. This meeting uh, will hopefully get him to say something and speak out about the pipeline, therefore helping to stop British Columbia from making a big mistake. And while this is the end of my speech, I can assure you that there will be much more of my journey in environmental activism to discuss in the very near future. Thank you for your time. Just have to be in the frame. Right. <laughs> you first. All right. Um, so, sorry. Um, I'm Jamie. Uh, I'm Ellington. Hi. And we're going to, we're grade 11 students um, at, in the Institute for Global Solutions, and we're going to talk to you about our project. So, um, our goal since the beginning has been to create an opportunity for youth and planet to not only discuss the local issues that matter to them, but to have direct connections to local governments to ensure that we see real change. Our solution to this problem is to contact the mayor and propose our idea for a youth advisory council. 
after enthusiastic support from the mayor, we began our work. In collaboration with some very skilled and capable people, we came to develop our blueprint for the project. So we had some setbacks. <laughs> it became evident that we were going to face a lot of them, actually, and our plans had to change accordingly. Everything from our target demographics to our general blueprints were subject to change during our process. Just one of many challenges was outreach and communication regarding our recruitment and search for members. After attempting to make contact with various school administrators, we reached a dead end in our process. With no responses from our contacts, no publicity to promote our project, we were forced to reevaluate our original plan and open up our application to students at Claremont who were already informed and enthusiastic about the project. So um, as Jamie mentioned, it didn't exactly go as smoothly as we hoped. Um, Turns out it's harder to reach principals than we figured. So what we ended up doing was we managed to get two students from Reynolds and Stelly's um, and then the rest from Claremont for a total of 11 students. Hopefully we expand in the future, we hope to uh, expand our demographic to other schools. But one, some of the goals that we identified initially when talking with the mayor um, were very provisional are uh, financial literacy for youth police interactions revolving around um, racism, but also safe driving as driving something that's a, a, a very big moment in a, a high schooler's life. And then also environment, obviously, that's something that is a, a very key focus for us. And then another one of our goals was to have build this up to be a self-sustaining organization, if you want to say it that way, have as when we're gone, we want to be able to, for our members to um, bring in new people and keep the dialogue open and really have this as like um, an avenue for the mayor and Sanish in general to access the opinions of youth and really bring them into the fold in terms of uh, making decisions politically, on, at least on a smaller scale right now. So what we've done so far is we've made connections with the Sanish police and RBC, and we hope to um, schedule some further meetings in the future. And recently this Thursday, we met with two students from St. Michael's who are creating a, um, an initiative called Be My Friend, which is pairing up um, kids that basically have a harder time socially with uh, volunteers that um, share some similar interest, which uh, we thought was a really awesome uh, initiative and that one we're, we're hoping to collaborate with them on. So one of our longer term goals is to create physical events where we can invite members of the community, young people to come and have open discussions and share their ideas so that we can take them directly to the mayor with whatever concerns we have. And then obviously the mayor can bring his concerns to us and we can provide our input and kind of have a, a symbiotic relationship in that dynamic. So yeah, we want to have with um, RBC some uh, workshops for some financial literacy of some kind or interactions with the police, uh, how like, open discussions in terms of that, not just an open house with the general community. So what our next, uh, what our plan is now is now that we've actually gathered our members, we're gonna um, sit down together, uh, start brainstorming our ideas, and basically draft up a, a whole list of things that we wanna bring uh, attention to in the city. So that's where we're heading next. Um, and then maybe further down the line, if, if this succeeds, and which hopefully it does, we maybe can promote this um, into a, a wider demographic, maybe to Victoria or Vancouver, or maybe anywhere in Canada really is something that we wanna show with like this pilot project that we can get youth involved anywhere in the world, um, not just like a fairly, um, I guess, liberal place like Victoria, maybe we could spread it to the US, which would be amazing. So, um, yeah, for right now, we hope to keep our momentum going because we have a really good start. Um, and ultimately, it's about empowering young people, bringing their voices into the fold of at least local politics for now. Hopefully in the future, we can go provincial or federal, maybe some kind of program there. We can have more voices being heard because obviously right now, we're a really we're educated, we're involved with everything that's going on in the world right now. And oftentimes we aren't really listened to. So we're doing right now what we can to get involved on a smaller scale. And hopefully that can expand into something bigger. Um, 
So thank you very much for listening to our project. If you have any questions, we're uh, open to answer them. Uh, hi, my name is Caitlin, and I'm going to be talking to you guys a little bit about my foundation, Solar Driving. Um, so this kind of started last year in IGS uh, for my grade 11 Do Good project. Uh, before COVID, uh, all of the students in the class were assigned a task to do good in the community or in the world anywhere we see fit. Uh, so this is an action-based project, and basically the goal is just to make a difference in the world. Uh, so Solar Driving, it's a nonprofit foundation. Um, so basically what my goal is, is to get youth into sustainable transportation in the form of electric vehicles. Uh, these will be elect uh, electric Nissan Leafs. And in order for them to get the cars, uh, they're going to be having to do volunteer work in the community. Um, and my goal is to have them volunteer with the elders in the community. This could be driving them to their doctor's appointments, helping them walk their dogs, take them to the doctor's appointments and grocery stores, um, and basically getting youth involved in the community more in a sustainable way that creates intergenerational relationships in order to better our future. Uh, so right now, I think this is really important after all of the COVID isolation we've had um, between youth and the seniors in the community. They, I feel like, have suffered the most because youth are used to being with their friends and going out and doing things. And the seniors are used to their families coming over and helping them. However, in the COVID situation we've had, we haven't been able to do those things. Um, so I think with the reopening of the province and the country, it uh, is a good time to get people connecting again and have that bond happening to get started again. Uh, and then, start back. Um, and then in the global climate emergency, uh, we know this is a big issue. We've been facing it for many years, but now it's just starting to become more talked about. And I think with the electric vehicle aspect, it's super important that these youth are driving around and not making a big impact on the environment. And also being a student, it's hard to afford a car, especially if you know you want to drive a sustainable vehicle. So I think it's super important that you know we're giving youth this opportunity to not only make a difference but also lower their environmental impact. And for students who are working multiple jobs, it can be difficult to bus around and try and make their shifts on time. So vehicles just make that a lot easier. Um, so I hope to launch this program in September of 2021 as I'm heading into my university years. Um, ideally, I'll be starting with five cars uh, for the first year and then hopefully growing from there. Ideally, eventually I'd like to grow to more communities across BC and maybe eventually Canada, uh, maybe a countrywide program that we can get more youth and more elderly people involved in this foundation. And then yeah, basically it's just building a stronger and more sustainable future for everyone. Everyone benefits from this. Um, it's economical, sustainable, and so important to build those relationships right now. Thank you for your time. Hey, we. Give it back to you, Katrina. We're just gonna set up our kids while we, uh, anybody who wants to comment can. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I'm So as I've been listening, um, Troy, I've signed your petition and tweeted about it. I don't know if you have a Twitter handle, but um, I'll retweet it again if, if you do. Um, I think I'm just so pleased to hear um, all of your amazing presentations. And as I'm listening, one of, um, one of the projects that I'm involved in is uh, a project on, um, it started actually as a, a, a community-based research project on 
youth resilience uh, and a, in an effort to address youth suicidality. And as I'm listening to you, some of the things that we're hearing in this uh, research where we're listening to youth, young people and emerging adults about what they need, so much of, of, of what people are, are saying is they need places to find a sense of hope and belonging and a sense of um, feeling like there's a reason and that they can play a role uh, in, a, in shaping the future that they're walking into and, um, and to be part of learning together across generations, across disciplines. So the things that you are doing are the same things that we are hearing in an entirely different research context about what young people need to feel like they have hope and are part of a community and the whole idea of, of um, cultivating resilience at a community level is is being demonstrated by the by the work that you're doing together so i'm i'm so happy to hear this um really inspired i i can't agree more about how important it is for really passionate public dialogue about um about our futures and that the policy distance in canada for most people is is quite far. Um, and yet here you have this pathway to be part of conversations. Um, and I hope that you continue to forge new pathways and, um, and stand beside people who will, will hold up the case, hold this case for you about, um, about how important youth voices are in shaping solutions for our collective futures, because um, there's this sort of strangely siloed way of thinking about who gets to say what, when, and what matters, when actually um, the people who are making a lot of decisions right now were part of, of creating an environment that actually dramatically needs shifting. Uh, and you've just demonstrated in, in four very beautiful ways of solutions that help us to shift that conversation. So thank you so much um, for sharing those inspiring stories. and. Um, and uh, I'm excited to hear more and see where the, where these go next. But I'm going to just pause and see if perhaps um, perhaps we'll take any clarifying questions for just a moment or two, uh, and then I'll ask for Maya and Musa. Uh, although I don't see Musa on just yet, so I'll just ask Tasha if you've seen Musa. But uh, just in case there are any clarifying questions about any of the students' presentations. Uh, I just have a quick comment, actually. Um, just wanted to say thank you all so much. They were truly excellent presentations. And in particular, Olivia, I think you said something very powerful that really struck me. Um, it was, you know, taking a shorter shower isn't going to change anything that really the large producers hold. Um, all of these powerful decisions. And um, thank you for being frustrated with that um, and showing your frustrations and anger because that's really the political drive that we need. Um, so that's just something that really stuck out to me and, and thank you. Thanks, it means a lot. Uh, Katrina, there's also um, a chat that we got from Julia Chalmers, who I'll just read it out loud. She says, wow, I am so inspired by these students. I aspire to be as creative, driven, and impactful as this class of young people. Keep it going, guys. You're making such a difference. Thanks. Thanks, Tasha, and thanks, Julia, for that. Are there any other clarifying questions? Or maybe I'll turn it, if, if not, I'll turn it over to Maya for now for a comment. And then um, what I'd love to do, we have we have a nice amount of time. So it would be wonderful to have a bit of dialogue as well. Um, and I and I see you're all lined up kind of close to the computer. So uh, for the students in IGS right now in the classroom, just as a note, um, if you're answering or responding, if you could just try and project your voice a little bit, because there's a bit of distance from the computer. And I just want to make sure we can hear all of you. But Maya, I'll turn it over to you to comment um, and then and then we'll see where the conversation goes. Thank you so much. So absolutely, it is an incredible honor to be here. And it's amazing um, to be able to be in this virtual space, actually. I'm coming to you from uh, the Discovery Islands, from Klahus, Hamalko, Salaman, and Kwakutl territory. Um, and uh, I'm beaming in um, to where all of you are in your incredible places. 
I I have some um, some thoughts um, and like Katrina, I work a lot in this space as a researcher. I'm a I'm a faculty member in the Faculty of Health Sciences at Simon Fraser University, um, and I work uh, as an eco-social health equity scholar. So I work where you're working in this space between ecological systems and social systems and trying to figure out how to do what you're doing, speak truth to power uh, around these big, what we call wicked problems and these uh, big game changers in the social and environmental space. And my work uh, touches a lot on intensive resource extraction and the impacts on especially rural, remote, northern and indigenous communities. Um, and I work a lot on um, climate change and youth and issues of intergenerational justice with a real focus often on um, uh, mental health and eco anxiety and things like that. So that's a little bit where I'm going to speak from. Um, and but I want to just say that I, I'm so delighted that you have, you are embodying and learning how to practice something that I took a long time to figure out how to do. When I was in my early 20s, I set up a nonprofit educational society, trying to work on the same kind of global health issues at the interface between human environment uh, and animal health. Um, and what I see you all embodying is this great understanding of how the world is connected, how we can begin as individuals, and how we can find threads and see connections and raise our gaze uh, out into the, the, not only the social space and the international space, but also out into, you know, ourselves as planetary beings. And this kind of awareness is the kind of awareness that we are fighting for and grappling with and trying to you know create a change in our our dominant epistemic views and so on and so when you're coming at these issues already understanding that you know that we are part of this great web of interconnection um, we are so far ahead already with you the other thing I wanted to agree with um, is this idea of the importance of hope and um, the fact that you center on not trying to focus on cataclysm. It's this grounded hope, this idea that you are having this realistic understanding of what's going on in the world. Um, you know, Livy, you talked about the big conundrums. Troy, you talked about, you know, this the the ways in which you have to try and and move through the sludge of current practices and governmental processes and, and biases and so on. And Jamie and Ellington, you're trying to, you know, actually bring useful youth voices into decision making processes early and then um you know i think also it was really interesting to hear you talk caitlin about trying to think okay how do we actually start to embody solutions uh in these kind of intergenerational ways as well so it's very important to not stay in the in the crisis mode, but actually to move into the action mode. And it's very powerful that you're thinking with your head, your hearts and your hands, because you are, I think that's partly why you are able to speak truth to power in such a grounded way, because you're not getting tricked uh, and you're not allowing, you know, Troy, you were talking about like this, like adult splaining is what I wrote down when, you know, it's just like you didn't, you didn't fall for it. You know, you're really grounded in what you know, you're grounded in your intuition about what needs to be understood. You have this ability to go back historically and understand how we got here. You know, what are some of the benefits to the path we've taken? as a society, but also how we need to really make a change in order to um, do, make a different kind of world. And you're talking about real issues, like what are the costs um, and uh, of doing what we're doing now? And what are the costs of not changing? And these are all the kinds of issues that we try and work with uh, politicians around. And I spend, you know, hours and, and years kind of trudging through the evidence building to kind of tell these these evidence-based stories of, of, of the kinds of insights that you already have. Um, and so I just want to commend each of you for your work. 
um, for your courageousness, for your um, ingenuity and your tenacity. Um, and say that uh, it's really an exciting moment to be here with you. And um, I hope that you go into your university lives or your community organizing lives or all the different kinds of wonderful lives and pathways you'll have and um, and carry this this light that you have in you that um, is not afraid of the truth and reality but will not uh, accept anything but seeing a, a different way forward a path to a better future so thank you very much Thanks, Maya. Uh, yeah, and I, I agree. I wonder if um, if you'd like, if the panel, student panel would like a chance to respond to any of those comments. Yeah, um, absolutely. Actually, I think uh, what you've been talking about and your field of um, research uh, with youth and mental health is actually very applicable to um, where our project kind of began actually, which was um, it was uh, from a place of anxiety, actually. Um, a lot of anxiety about um, our future and what that's going to look like for young people. And I remember actually uh, the conversation that started it all with uh, Mr. Newfeld and the uh, that was, uh, I don't think that's something that I'm going to forget because I just, to, to put it bluntly, um, I'm, I think young people in general, I think most of us would agree when we say a lot of the, um, a lot of the feedback we've been getting from adults has been very unhelpful, which is either um, kind of, empty promises or um, the assumption that we don't know what we're talking about and that we don't deserve to have an opinion on um, on all of this. So I, I really wanna say uh, thank you for what you said. And uh, I, I do think that uh, hopefully when we have these discussions, we can move forward from a place where we can understand each other respectfully. Thank you. I just want to thank you so much for your words and um, they touch me so deeply and um, I'm really heartbroken actually by um, the the voicelessness that you have and feel and um, that's probably the key thing that sits at the center of my work is to um, figure out how we can um, in the adult world change how we understand um, youth voice and why I'm so passionate about intergenerational climate justice. And I think that, um, you know, when my daughter who's 11 showed me this picture she drew and she's like, this is today and this is 2050 and it's just this earth in flames. And she always asked me, so in 2050 when I'm dead, how old will I be and stuff? And I just think that is no way to have a childhood. That is no way to enter adulthood. We cannot, we cannot allow this to happen. So we do need to work together and listen to all of you and build a hopeful future and there's just no other option so absolutely you're not you're not alone um and we are here to work together yeah i have a son who is oh that's okay go ahead livia I, go ahead i just want to say how amazing it is that all of you are listening because we do have the, the overarching feeling a lot of the time that we, our voices are, are very small because we are going through education. Every day we are learning something that is completely brand new to us, but it's amazing that you are here and a panel of people are here listening to people who are young as me in grade nine. Um, it's quite amazing and I find it very empowering and I would like to thank everyone. Um, I'd also just like to say that no matter how much you tell a person a pro is black, if they've known it all their life to be white, that's how they're gonna see it. Um, and that's how we kind of need to approach this. The difficulties that we have with people possibly not understanding climate change. Um, 
I think that a lot of people get caught up in the radicalism. And I think that it's really amazing to see that we are starting to come to the same table on a lot of issues. Um, mm -hmm. That we're not one against the other, but a lot of people are coming together realizing this is an issue and it needs to be fixed. And I think it's amazing that people are here and people are listening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Livia, I think this is such an important point because I do think for a long time there's been an assumption that um, that we can that this is just it's not our problem to fix and now actually it's so loud it, it's it's no longer acceptable to say that it's not and and even um, when I hear some uh, policy statements coming out of what are traditionally fairly um, conservative or right leaning bodies. Um, political bodies are acknowledging are acknowledging the increasingly acknowledging the scale of the problem um, and and so it's a moment of of greater openness I think for recognizing our collective uh, how tied up all of our lives are in each other's lives um, that we can't escape this that we are we really are building collective futures together um, Stefan, I see you turned your video on, and Prince, I saw you for a moment as well. Would, would either of you like to chime in? Hi, Katrina. I'm just now catching up. I was switching in between meetings because I had a conflict. Uh, so, yeah, I'll let the others go and then I'll come back. All right. Yes. Wonderful. Nice to have you here. No worries. Yeah, I, I'd like to say a, a few words. Uh, Katrina, I'm uh, I'm Stefan Krzywowski. I'm a family physician, a rural family physician and a professor at the University of British Columbia. Um, and I have to confess that I've really uh, only woken up in the last five years or so, uh, coincident with the birth of my grandchildren, uh, of who, whom I have now five. And uh, I think that something about that process of uh, witnessing uh, the arrival of these little people who are going to grow up in this world has really brought to my attention how badly uh, you know I've contributed to mismanaging uh, the world over the years uh, and the ecosystems that I engage with. Because um, I, I can't say that I'm terribly, um, terribly proud of my approach, which has been just kind of with the herd, you know, going along and doing what I, what I, what I need to do to to live. Um, and I think we all need to wake up. Uh, and I think that's what, that's what uh, this process is about. It's about awakening people to recognize that, that the distress, that the anxiety that we feel collectively uh, can be uh, dealt with. It needs to be dealt with by action. It needs to be dealt with by actually doing something to improve the sustainability of our, our planet's ecosystems. And, you know, I, the, the job is yours, actually, unfortunately. Uh, you know, you guys are the ones who need to be in the driver's seat. Uh, and I really appreciated the presentations you did today because it's all about um, stepping up and taking your place in that process. And it's a little daunting, for sure. Uh, there is a, a great uh, support, and that is intergenerational collaboration because this is going to be open on everybody's desk. There's nobody who's not going to be paying attention to uh, the, the pain of climate change and ecosystem disruption as, as time goes forward. So it's all about collaborating and working together. And I really appreciated hearing uh, what, what you guys are doing. Um, uh, I have the privilege and opportunity of, of working with medical students. Uh, uh, and uh, you know one of the projects that uh, one of the students is working on is about uh, empowering uh, youth voice in the area of, uh, of um, through the eyes of a young doctor, a young doctor to be. And uh, I don't know if Luke, if you wanna say anything about that, but uh, I think that uh, um, it's, uh, it's a pretty cool idea. And uh, I really, really appreciate hearing your voices because they're, they're so well-formed that uh, you've got so much confidence. I really like to hear it. It's great, thanks. Mm. Thanks so much, Stefan. Would you like an opportunity to, to respond? And if and then maybe um, maybe Luke, you'll share a little bit about the work that you're doing. I'm sorry to put you on the spot like that, Luke. I kind of dumped <laughs> you right in there without without even asking you. But uh... yeah, no, I'm happy to 
to say something. Thanks, thanks, Stefan. Um, yeah, so like Stefan mentioned, I'm a, I'm a first year medical student, and I am um, currently working on uh, a research project looking at how can we empower youth um, to make some meaningful changes in their communities. And it is amazing to see all the work that you are doing. And I really appreciate hearing about it. It's, it's I, your energy and your passion and innovation is mind blowing. Um, so thank you for being who you are and for contributing to um, this meeting today. Um, a lot of my, my research is on, yeah, like I said, trying to find ways to empower youth. And what I'm finding is a lot of literature out there is saying that, uh, is kind of saying that ways we engage with youth is by like adults going up to youth and being like, hey, how can, or what, what kind of things do you want us to do for you type thing? It's very passive engagement um, in that way. And to me, that's unacceptable. Um, I think you, youth are not only the future um, decision makers, but they're also the present because they have passion and what decisions we make now impact what the future of youth are gonna look like. So youth need to be given a platform to speak up when they want to. And right now society isn't designed that way. Um, so I'm looking at ways of make, how, how can we as society perhaps change and how can rural physicians, what role can they play in that changing of society by advocating alongside youth um, to give youth that platform? And the example I keep, I keep drawing on is for youth empowerment is the climate strikes of 2019 and how across the globe, youth just took the world into their own hands and made the world listen to them. And I found that energy and excitement and passion to be so contagious. And I think that's what youth can do every single day if society were to be shaped that way to allow youth to speak up. So hopefully I can contribute some knowledge in that area and what you guys are doing in the presentations you, you gave today are exactly what needs to happen. And I hope to see more of that. And I'm excited to see where your projects end up going. Thank you, Luke. And it sounds like such, I'm so glad and inspired to hear about the amount of effort and interest in amplifying youth voices. And um, I do think there is, there are very meaningful ways that we can have more constructive dialogue space where across generations, we can listen and learn from each other. And um, I think that the, there is also this, um, and it's not just in high schools or elementary schools, it's across the board. There's certain sometimes an assumption that we have to always learn in an abstract or like a uh, use a case study or do something kind of like somehow distanced. Um, but in my experience, no matter what setting I've been in, um, when you can blend this like very real connected learning with each other and doing something in service, like not just make work <laughs> learning, but like real stuff um, that actually is connected to community and actually is solutions focused. I think that we actually see uh, a tremendous transformation in all of the people who have the opportunity to be involved. Um, not just the learners uh, who are in sort of a designated learner role, but what people tend to realize is that actually we're all learners together. Uh, and there's a lot that we can do when we actually um, bring people together. And I, Maya, you mentioned, I, I have a 10 year old and a six year old. Um, and so I think about these things a lot for my own children and, and they are preoccupied about it and they have worries and anxieties about their future already. And my littlest one, Sasha, he, um, I, so I, I'll back up a bit. I, so I, I told you I was joining you from um, the traditional territory of the Silk people. I also have ties to Treaty 4 area in Saskatchewan, where my grandmother was born on Fishing Lake First Nation. So I have Cree ancestry, and this is very important to me. And I spend a lot of time with my children um, sharing what I can about how important it is to love and care for and be connected 
to the earth and to trees and plants and, and to, to really feel our connection to them. And Sasha, one day we were out for a walk and he stopped and he put his head against this massive grandmother tree, a big fir. Um, and he said, she has something important to say, mommy. She's saying it's time to open our hearts and, and look at, at the new world. It's time, she says. So my six-year-old powerfully just randomly one day says this. Um, I, I think it's important. A six-year-old has something important to say. We need to listen, uh, not just dismiss it as, as six-year-olds speak. It's actually child wisdom um, that needs to be heard. I'm wondering if anyone else would love to um, offer something to say, maybe perhaps Raluca or I'm not sure. Betty, I'm not sure. Uh, whether you're a Betty, I know. I know a few Bettys, <laughs> but um, I'm just invite any other one else if they'd like I, to. I've got some thoughts. Oh, yes, go ahead. Please do. Um, my head can... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll sit out. So um, what I was thinking, uh, as we were kind of like talking about all this, kind of going back to what Mayo was saying um, about like speaking truth to power is I think the connection between anyone that's not in power and anyone that is in power is very severed. So I think it's not a problem of, I know like pretty much everyone around me wants to do something, but like, we just don't know where to start, right? It's like the, it, it's like the, the, the all boys club, I, to put it simply, right? It's like um, the power stays where it is. So I think that's something that, holds um, really anyone back that's trying to make a change, right? Is because in, when, when you can't access the people that you need to, it's it makes it way harder. And like, obviously it's as much an economic issue as it is a moral issue. Um, mm -hmm. So we don't know what all the answers are, but having what we're trying to do is build uh, or at least break down the walls between us and the people that are making the decisions because ultimately like they're people too right so if what i really think is if we can just get there here like we we actually could do something because at the end of the day they aside from their economic interests they have interests for their kids as well so yeah. they they have to balance two worlds of like of their investors but also what they think is right. Some people might just be oblivious to it, but I think that if we can build more connections like that, then we can really like come at this from a, a point of like compassion and a way that doesn't dehumanize the people in power, because I think we, we do that quite a lot, even yeah. though um, they do have, they have so many things that they have to balance, which it, may, it makes it a lot harder for them, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That distance is very far. Um, but you're correct. We, people are people. <laughs> and sometimes we need to find that pathway or platform to 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 not dehumanize, no matter no matter what position of power they're in. Um, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, yeah, I first of all very much agree with that. Like, there's definitely that distance right now, and lack of transparency, and definitely breaking down some of those walls will help the public get more involved in the decision making. And first of all, I'm just really glad to hear all of your voices and different presentations. And secondly, I'm really glad like there's that point of activism that's coming out and addressing the underlying issues, especially because we hear um, some of the issues that people are currently seeing and what's visible to the eye, but we often don't really dig into those underlying issues. And I'm really glad that some of them have come up. And um, in terms of the activism, I'm really glad like that critical thinking part is sort of coming up more with youth and just the general public asking those difficult questions mm -hmm. and addressing some of those weak comments by some of the decision makers. And if you want to dig in even deeper, just a piece of advice, um, feel free to look up some of their reports or their environmental impact assessment reports, especially. 
um, you will find a lot more things that are misleading and vague and scientifically not very accurate. You can tell by the way they've conducted their studies and even just the language that they use to write the reports. You can make really good arguments using their own reports. So mm -hmm. that's a piece of advice I would definitely like to pass on. And yeah, I, I definitely agree with what you said that they're also just people and playing to their emotions and the fact that they also have children is something that will possibly get to them and again, reduce that gap. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, great presentations, everyone. Thanks so much, Irvi. Um, there's also just a comment from Raluca who's saying she's having some audio video issues, but she's just said, I'm in incredibly inspired by youth and I try to empower all those who take my health impacts of climate change course at UBC, which she teaches. It's an interdisciplinary course that all students across campus can take. Um, and she, she tries to make connections wherever possible. I have much to learn from you. Your voice and energy gives people like me momentum to dedicate my time to understanding planetary health and offering education to healthcare providers regarding their roles, um, where their roles are situated. So really uh, calling on um, using all of our platform. And that's something else I, I, I appreciate too about what you're saying, Raluca, is all of us have some sort of a platform from which we can speak, everybody, no matter where we're positioned in society, there's there's some sort of a platform that we hold and uh, or stand on. And sometimes, um, sometimes it can be surprising where we have influence uh, if we just actually um, dare to use that platform, which I think, uh, isn't that something about, isn't the motto, Mark, what's, isn't the motto of the Institute something like dare to change the world? Yeah, dare to change our world. Dare to change our world. Yeah, it's a beautiful motto. Um, and just, I mean, uh, Arlen saying great presentations. Thank you for speaking up. Your words are so powerful. I agree with Raluca. Definitely a lot to learn from all of you. I hope we move towards an action drive future while empowering another. And Prince also offering, I agree with you, Raluca. I'm inspired. So you've, you've offered a, fair, a very inspiring uh, set of presentations. I would ask maybe one question I'll, I'll put forward to you and others in the classroom too is here you have um, here you have a platform where a lot of people in positions of influence um, are are sitting and uh, what what would be your challenge to us if you had one wish um, on us oh a hand just shut up really fast tell us we are... <laughs> All right. Um, hello, I'm Dan and Fine, and I just I, I just want to say one of the things I'd like to say is, if we don't treat climate change as a pending issue, this is something that's happening. It's affecting me. It's affecting my kids. I shouldn't have to wake up tomorrow and worry about where my kids are going to be in fifty years. Like in forty years, when I'm fifty four, whatever it is nowadays, I don't know off the top of my head, but it'll be what is my world going to look like? What is our world going to look like? And one of the things about that is worrying about that and treating it as if it's not happening and it's we can just sit back and push it off to the next generation is what we've been doing for 50 years. There's no point in doing that anymore. All of our pending issues from racism to systemic racism to climate change to electoral reform. Our generation, partly because of climate change, because it is so in your face and it's so obvious, and I think Livia put it best, people can't put a face to it, so they don't really quite, they can't wrap their head around, this is something that needs to happen right now. It is not a something where we could just push it off again and keep keep heading on, the status quo doesn't do, status quo doesn't do it. We have to, go and treat it as if it's something that is important. It is, it is, it is, it is very important. And specifically when it comes because to future and the future and the future, my future and the future, for future generations, it's I want my kids to be able to have a world where they don't have to wear gas masks and be out in the world. And 
the the thing also I think a common misconception with climate change is the planet is going to die. That is the misconception that I think a lot of people have. Is it's the planet is going to survive. It is going to do dinosaurs again. We're like, hey, let's do dinosaurs again. Yay! All the filthy humans are gone. No, we are going to die. This is not a and a bunch of species will go extinct, but the planet will survive and it will move on. And you know, like we had mass extinction events before. It's like you know, so this is we created this issue. This is our fault. This is our issue to deal with. And if we don't, well, we won't be here, I suppose, would be the best way to put it. Yeah. Thanks, Jenna. Thank you. I really appreciate the comment. And I think it's true. And when sometimes people ask me, well, I don't know, how do you how do you even start working on these issues? I always say, just think about it is an intergenerational justice issue and it's kind of what you said and then if we've got all these targets for 2050 um, then think about okay so someone who's born today or someone who's uh, 14 today or whatever what is their life going to look like as we transition from today to 2050 it's all the things you said what are the equity issues what are the dress trans transition issues how are we going to deal with social justice environmental justice and so on and i think that really puts a fine grain on it when you have a time frame and you look at people people's journey through a life and um into their midlife and then it it puts a fine point huh, on these these theoretical conversations we're having so i agree very mm -hmm. much yes yeah so much of so much of the work i do is is uh, it's about equity work which climate work is equity work and uh you know one of the things that that i find frustrating is when people get too bogged down in a sort of sense of overwhelmed it's too much of a wicked problem we can't do this well actually uh, i think it was dan you're absolutely correct humans made up this problem <laughs> we create our systems we made up the idea of race and we can we created racism we can change it Humans are tremendously creative and capable. And um, when we put ourselves, our heads together and our hearts together and actually work together, we can reconstruct it. It's not small work. It's actually quite revolutionary work. Uh, but I think there's a person sitting in the room who has a beautiful song about tiny revolutions. And everything you're doing is a tiny revolution toward a more equitable future. And I think it's worthy of doing. It's worthy of doing. And uh, yeah. Um, I think I saw more than one hand shoot up pretty quickly in your classroom. Was there anyone else who wanted to offer another comment or challenge to this group of people? Um, so my name's Danny, and something that I want to bring to light is, I feel like as people have noticed, as the pandemic has uh, gotten, gone on longer, they've noticed that there has been a larger impact on mental health between a lot of teenagers because of the lack of social interaction with each other. And I feel that schools in general have not seen, you know, how they can help. And I feel like, you know, school boards just saying, we care, we want to do what's best for you. It's not enough because it's not actually affecting how things are happening in classrooms and how teachers are interacting with students because you know, a lot of adults, I feel, they don't realize what a lot of the things they're saying actually cause worse than things that are better. Like, you know, if somebody is going through a really hard time and is having, you know, is acting very emotional and stressed out, saying things like relax and calm down, they don't help. They actually make things worse because they're kind of, you know, invalidating how that person is feeling. And I've experienced that a lot. And I feel like people don't pick up on any of the social cues that teenagers have because a lot of teenagers tend to hide, you know, and they're very good at hiding, you know, things that they're going through because otherwise they feel alienated and they feel like and no one is going to see them as who they are. They're just going to see them as, oh, that's the weird person who's struggling with ADHD or that person has, you know, um, depression, therefore they're a very sad individual. And something that I really want to bring to light because I feel so many adults are like, um, you know, social media and phones are the first thing to blame for anxiety or mental health. Well, 
something that a quote that I really think about is autism wasn't diagnosed until 1930. Uh, well, Mount Everest wasn't discovered until the 1800s, but I believe it was there the entire time. You know, there it's been around the entire time, but nobody's actually taken into account to notice. And for a while, people have just been classified as crazy and put into institutions where they believed shock therapy made things better instead of worse. And so I just want to see how, you know, adults that are here currently want to help for the future generation that's going to happen. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, these are, these are, these are big, uh, there's, uh, there, I do think that there is a tendency to, um, and I think it, you know, uh, Livia, you talked about industrial revolution. Um, and I think if we take even a step further, sometimes I think that we have a lot of things to be grateful for, for the Renaissance and a lot of things to undo from the harms that were created um, from a sort of, from the, like from separation of mind and body, for example, or, or a tendency to be incredibly linear and reductionist in Western thinking. These are, these are legacies that are actually many hundreds of years old that still um, produce assumptions that, that make it more permissible or less permissible to be human <laughs> in the spaces that we are and, and all of our complexity. And, um, and I do think that the pandemic has shone a pretty bright light on a lot of things in society that aren't working very well. Um, and it's yet to be seen how we will use that to inform making changes moving forward. But one of the things you said that resonates strongly with me um, and with the other research I mentioned I do around uh, community-based resilience for youth um, is that this assumption that social media or the media or TV or, or like that that somehow the, the cause of all ills for young people, um, I would say that young people in the Okanagan agree with you that that is absolutely not the primary concern. What's mostly the concern is not being heard and seen. Um, and there's a desire to belong to something meaningful, um, to be feel like um, there's a meaningful role in society. And, um, and that is what I hear more young people calling for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so you asked what you guys can do, and I was thinking you have more leverage in the world than we do just in the position that you guys are. So while I think if some of us are going to a larger scale, some of us are going on a small scale, but I think the small scale is the starter, and then we want to build it bigger. But I think if you guys want to do something, then I would say leverage your leverage and re like just reach out to like your contacts just just do what you can right because you you probably have more connections than we do so i would say that if you want to do something just start take it take it as big as possible take as big as you can right go to i guess email the, the person that you think could help the most um and i think that could really make a big difference, especially mm -hmm. as you're involved in universities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, be bold, hey? Go ahead, yes. Another point that I want to make, and I want to build on, on his point, is that we have a habit of applauding the adults that communicate with children that are saying, hey, can I reach out? But it should be the norm. It should be normal for adults, for Premier, for the president, for the prime minister to reach out to children and hear what we're saying. And yeah. I, I would also like to challenge you all to really connect with children and not just two or three, not once a week, but every single day, making sure that their opinions are heard about topics they didn't even know they had opinions on. Mm. Um, and as a lot of you are educators, a lot of you are people in positions where you have contacts, to make sure that others are getting the connection. If you know, like IGF is an amazing example of this, of if you know that there's a class of people that could really benefit from hearing someone that you know, make that connection. Make sure that the children are getting to the adults, 
even if it's a shot in the dark, make that shot because you never know what will happen. And as much as we love to think that we can make a massive impact, we still are relying on all of you to make connections for us. And so we can make our own and we can help connect. Thank you. Thank you so much for these. These are good and big challenges for all of us uh, listening to leverage our platforms to make connections to listen and to be um, to really think intentionally how we can model and demonstrate these good intentions for being engaged um, across generations and actually translate that into uh, a way that we we are in the world um, that it's not just a theoretical or abstract or sounds good celebrated you know photo op kind of thing that it's actually a way that we work a way that we are a way that we exist in the world um i want to thank you sincerely i'm conscious of the time we've come to the end of our time already um i'm so uh so happy and delighted to have been part of of this conversation today and to host you um Thank you to uh, to Mark and Graham and Joanna uh, for your leadership and for setting this up and um, to Maya for your comments. Um, uh, to all of you who've joined us today to each of us of you uh, on the student panel you're you're doing amazing things. Um, and I think that we can consider this an an open connection to stay connected to our ongoing community of practice through the BC Coalition Institute that I will I'll say I, this isn't a, an, a one time thing, but a starting point for continuing the conversation. So I, I do hope that we can continue to um, work with I and we we already are working with uh, the IGS program and with all of you on um, on keeping this conversation going. Um, I'm I'm conscious of it. We're past the 1130 mark, but if there's any um, last comments, a, a, a final goodbye from Mark in the classroom or from Maya, uh, I'll, I'll give you a quick opportunity for that and then um, wish you all a good day. Just gonna give my thanks is all. And, and we have a fire drill in two minutes anyway, because we are a high school. So uh, <laughs> thank you so much for caring about these young people and have, being willing to listen. And thanks so much. Thank Wonderful. Excellent work, all of you. Man. Thank you. Bye. I just good luck with your fire drill and indeed ongoing conversations to be had. Sounds good. Bye, guys. Thank Bye, you. friends. Nice to see you. Bye. Nice to see you, Katrina. <laughs>